Well, good evening, everyone. Mike Griffith here. Welcome to tonight's Ingles on the Beat special. It's a Mother's Day weekend special. And uh, who better than to talk about Georgia football on Mother's Day weekend than, than two very prominent mothers of prominent players. We've got Allie Daniels, the mother of JT Daniels, the quarterback. And, of course, most Georgia fans, they've gotten very familiar with Richard LeCount these last four years. And Erica LeCount joins us. And, you know, it's interesting, JT and Richard, both five-star players. So we got a couple of five-star moms here in uh, Allie and Eric, and obviously they've done a lot um, raising their children and helping them in their careers and getting to Georgia. I guess I want to start out, and uh, I guess I'll start with you, Allie. It, it's been such a long COVID-19 year, and it kind of happened in the middle of you know, a, a big transition period for JT, I think complicated things because it really affected JT's ability to rehabilitate his knee from what I understand. And I guess I'll kind of let you tell the story of how JT kind of went into the portal and, and end up in Georgia amid all this crazy COVID-19 stuff. Yeah, it did happen um, right in the beginning of COVID. He came home for spring break and then never went back to school, never went, he was at USC at the time and um, entered the portal while he was living with us in Long Beach. So we got to experience the whole craziness of what he had to go through during that time. And it was lots and lots of phone calls, lots and lots of um, going on the computer and studying, talking to other coaches. And um, that, that was really, last March, right? Yeah, so um, we, we it, that was a couple of months of going through that. And then he ended up um, going to Georgia January, uh, June 1st, we dropped him off. Wow, so a big year for JT Daniels is he was in the transfer portal in the middle of this, trying to pick out a school, a lot of different phone calls, certainly. Uh, meanwhile, back at Georgia, Erica, Richard had decided to return for his senior year. Richard said he had unfinished business, a uh, very successful bowl game. Uh, Richard was playing outstanding football. His decision to return, I think, affected a lot of other folks. And then all of a sudden, there's no spring football. So what happens when there's no spring football at Georgia for Richard LeCount? <laughs> well, when there's no um, spring football for Georgia, Richard is in someone's jail. He is someplace running, um, jogging, working out, uh, but he is he is still engaged. I have not witnessed him idle since he's been about four or five years old without a sport, whether it was football, track, basketball, or baseball. <laughs> he, we, it's no off season. It's no <laughs> off day. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Allie, how did how did JT deal with that? Because, uh, you know, he's he's another he's another guy that like Richard kind of known as being a, a, a gym rat kind of guy, always looking to work out. Where was he working out, throwing? How did he manage to do that uh, back home in California? Because he wasn't with USC. And he, as you said, he didn't show up in Georgia until the beginning of June. Right. Um, it was about. He went to uh, Scott Prohaska, who was able to um, have people come and out of his garage at his house. So that was one place he was going and doing some rehab. He was also going, um, we were living in Long Beach and he drove to Santa Ana and did a rehab there twice a day. So it was about 30 minutes traveling each way for that, it was two hours of driving for you know, less than two hours of rehab. So he really loves Georgia and how close everything is. And that is just one of the benefits of being in a small town in a small college place. He, he just loves how much more intimate it is. Yes. <laughs> you know, Eric, I want to ask you, that, now that's interesting. So JT comes from California. I don't know if he's been home yet because when we no. talk to him, he has not been home yet. No. So from June no. 1, he didn't go home for now, Richard, you know, Riceboro is a good four hour drive. We were five hour drive. OK, <laughs> you were telling me earlier, Richard's been making this drive since he was about 17 years old, though, when he was doing. Has he tried to get 
back and forth? And, and how has that gone for him during the COVID-19? Because they had all these stipulations and, and COVID rules in place. Well, now, you know, during COVID, uh, Richard, at some point, when after he left from school is when you're asking, because he was training in Florida at that time. So he, he was getting back and forth inside a gym. Now, at one point, I remember him calling and saying that he were down in, in Miami with um, his, his best friend, Raekwon, and that uh, the gym had gotten shut down due to COVID. And he was in a panic mode. <laughs> he was like, you know, I got to get out of the city, you know, out of this town. This town. I got to, I got to leave here. They, they shutting down everything. And it was at the height of, of, of the pandemic when it hit down in Florida and they were closing down everything. And, and I just think it's really important for them, for the, the guys to stay in, engaged and, and working out. It keeps them focused, not only just working on their body. A lot of people don't understand when you're working out. That's so therapeutic. It keeps you, you know, that's like they, their time to meditate and focus, even though for a lot of people, um, it may not be that case. But for these athletes who, who JT is a lot like my son, I actually want to interject this piece. I did my research here. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to, to uh, just, um, I highlighted a little oh. of the story that Seth oh. Sim written about, about JT. Um, and I highlighted it. You're so sweet. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Because I wanted to engage with you on a motherly, you know. Thank you. I love uh, it. Couple. And, yes, I, and I, it. I wanted to know, you know, some of your likes and dislikes because the whole world knows who your son is. But a lot of the times people don't understand where, why the son acts the way he acts. Why is his demeanor that way? Or... Why is he a, um, let me see the word you use. Why is he <laughs> such an introvert? <laughs> Why is he so thoughtful and spiritual? That touched my heart. And I, I began to do my research and I, I Googled it. I, I love it. Yes, JT Daniels' mom. And Aww, yeah, I'm usually a, <laughs> you know, a fly on the wall in the background. And, and, and I am an introvert, so that's why it's a little difficult for me to do this Zoom call because I'm just, this is out of my comfort zone for sure. Aww, but, but um, I tell I, you one thing that was comforting to me, I found a lot of similarities between your son and my son. I love it. Not only do, do they play for Georgia, well, Richard used to, but um, I read that JT walked early, so did Richard. He talked early, so did Richard. He, and I read that he would climb out of his crib to play with his toys. So did Richard. <laughs> Everything on the floor every morning. Yes, so. and I don't want to turn this into a mommy talking about sons, you know, little little back in the past. But that stood out to me. And then when I got and when I read and got to the part where um, it said that he he's real shy. He's he has a shy personality like his mother. And yeah. He, He's really thoughtful and smart and spiritual. And, and I was like, you know, that's a lot of the qualities, not to take away from the dad, but this yeah. weekend is Mother's Day weekend. And yeah, it was saying that I a lot of the that. qualities. Thank you for sharing. Yes. That's so nice to hear. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> well, I, can, I can interject that another thing that, that both Richard and JT have in common is they're both team leaders. And they're able to motivate the people around them with the way they carry themselves. I think both of these guys uh, are very sensitive to the others around them. You know, Ali, I was struck when JT was asked about George Pickens injury uh, when it first happened in the spring. And the first thing JT said, well, first of all, for George, the person didn't, didn't talk about, boy, this is going to hurt the team. Wow. That's our best receiver. The first thing he talked about, was how he was going to try to stay engaged with George and keep George with the team because he recognized 
how much George needed football. So I guess I would just ask you uh, about that. I mean, does that come with the territory of being a quarterback? Has that been a very innate uh, quality of JT's? Has he always been that uh, self-aware of those around him in that manner? Um, you know, he, he is sensitive. He definitely is sensitive and, and he just went through that. He just went through the knee, um, injury. And I know he felt somewhat invisible for off and on for that year. And that was probably the impetus to make him say that about, um, Pickens, because I just, I think that he just went through that. Wow. So. Yeah, I mean, he was definitely sensitive to that issue of the person, not the football player, being injured as as well. And when it's your life, you know, there's something missing. So, well, let me let me dial that back a little bit, Allie. I want to go a little deeper into that, and then and certainly I've talked with Eric in the last couple of days about what Richard has gone through, and thank goodness has come out the other side of it. We'll get to that. Uh, here in a moment, right? But, uh, you know, here's JT, a, a guy, a, a five-star guy, a, a player of the year as a sophomore, a, a player of the year as a freshman, a Gatorade player. Everything's going his way. And he goes to USC, and the USC team doesn't win as much as everyone thinks they should. He had a couple 300-yard games. I think he threw for over 300 on Notre Dame in Texas. He's playing just fine. But the team is struggling a little bit. What is that like to watch your son go through that struggle? Because you, I, even though I know that's not 92,000 in the Coliseum every week, you had to hear the other people around you who may not know you're the quarterback's mom saying, what's going on with that quarterback? What is that like to be that mom hearing the complaints and the second guessing about your son under that spotlight? Um, well. It's difficult for sure, um, but I do, I honestly believe everybody has an opinion. So anyone can say whatever they want and I just don't want to listen to it, you know? <laughs> uh, that's why I don't, I don't do a lot of social media. I don't actually listen to a lot of the, I don't read a lot of the comments, especially if they're negative because they're entitled to their opinion, but I'm not going to let it ruin my day. You know, so I, I just kind of take a step back in that regard, I would say. Um, but during the USC experience, it was it was tough for him. And he really, really hadn't struggled very much in his life. And I have raised both my kids saying life is about learning lessons. You need to make mistakes. You need you don't grow and you don't learn if you don't have a problem or you don't, it's not a problem. It's an opportunity, right? So him being raised like that, he really didn't look at it. He, he had a different perspective on it. Although it was difficult to go through it, he knew he was growing and learning while it was happening. Doesn't make yeah. it easier, but you know, just knowing that that's, you're gonna get through it and you're going to learn and grow from it. That's, that's the blessing. Yeah. Well, you know, Erica, we, we look at Richard's uh, athletic career in, in Riceboro, which obviously is not the largest metropolitan area in the South. And, and he's a three sport. So I'm guessing that every game Richard played in, if, if Richard doesn't play well, the team's probably losing. And if Richard plays well, the team's probably losing. So you probably got through a lot of that with Richard being such a dynamic athlete. Uh, growing up there in Riceboro. So I want to ask you about the more recent struggle. And you said something fascinating to me, uh, I thought was fascinating when we were talking about what Richard's gone through recently. And it's well documented. Richard got in a motorcycle accident this season and, and uh, has been uh, working to get back. He's back now. He was drafted by the Cleveland Browns. And you said, you know, Mike, Richard's fallen off a bike plenty of times before in his life, but he's never done it with the whole world watching what was that like for you to see your son go through that? I don't, crisis is too strong of a world because that's just not how you all deal with things I learned. There's so much faith there. I can't call it a crisis because you all didn't treat it like that. I'll let, tell the story of how you and you dealt with it, what Richard's gone through. 
Well, from day starting from day one, um, during the accident at the at the, the scene of the accident, um, the whole world knows now that it was a person. It was an angel. It was this woman that was there that that told her story on my personal social media um, page about being led to go to the store and she don't know, remember why or anything. And she got in there and uh, she, ha she hadn't got to the store, but she, got, she arrived at the scene of an accident and she got out of a car because she wanted to see what was going on. And when, as she got out of the car, she looked around and she said everybody was kind of like um, personally praying within themselves and and that that alone let me know from day one although he went through that that horrible ordeal of falling off of that that motorcycle and and all of the pain he endured and everything he went through um you know it was a purpose behind it you know and similar to what JT's mom said um uh, when she just said it is is purpose behind a lot, then a lot, you know, it's a lot of purpose behind everything. And when and when the hands of God is on your life, you you go through a lot of adversity and a lot of persecution. We supposed to go through these things, but the the mindset and the attitude and the the demeanor that we take on and the way we want to we pick and make a choice how we gonna go through it. We go 100%. through it with integrity. We go yeah. through it with our integrity. We don't go through it um fighting and bickering back with the media or getting angry with someone the or media being the victim. Doing their job. that's right they're doing their job they're they're investigative reporters they're reporting um and if you train up your child in the way that he should go when he's in front of a reporter he's speaking the truth and being honest it shouldn't be anything hidden then hey whatever questions you got fire away all of this happened and, and, and it's over with now. And we understand every day what the purpose. He's worked harder than he worked before in his life on his body during this rehab time. He mm -hmm. had, Richard had not have had the time like he had during COVID and during this accident from all his life, even doing a little, you know, when, although he was a little child, he was steady going school, Sports, school, sports, school, sports. When all of the other children in the neighborhood and in the community and in the country is um, on summer breaks, he's playing basketball with AAU or, or playing travel baseball or whatever, or travel football with Cam Newton when he got old enough, you know, but his body hadn't had time. I know it sounds real harsh and it might sound strange to a lot of people, but he didn't have the time to rest. And that's one thing we know about this life that, that God will give us rest rather you you fell off a bike or whatever. You gotta try to find the, the silver lining in everything and be rejoicing and, and be happy that he wasn't dead. Yeah. Cause he, he could have been, it could have been the other way. So yeah. we moving yeah. forward from that. We moving forward. And you have, you know, and I was just, I, I listened to Richard did a press conference right after being drafted. <laughs> and of course, at Georgia, he was asked about it once and he answered. And we just, okay, that's enough. We know Richard, he told us why the Cleveland media must ask him. To, and he sat there so patient. I said, this is a guy who is so at peace with himself and so comfortable, but that doesn't just happen. It kind of, you know, I think about you know, what, what a mom's role is. And listen, the, the dad's role is huge. Like you said, usually it's the dad that's talking about the stats and the numbers <laughs> and the game plan, but, but behind the scenes, mom's kind of picking up the pieces here and there. And, and, and Allie, I guess I'll switch back to JT uh, because JT comes in with a knee brace on and we don't know when he's going to play at Georgia. Uh, you know, Kirby's hoping early on, he, well, hopefully he'll be cleared by the opener. That's the thought, but then he's not cleared for the opener. And then, then we all hear the drum beat. When is, when is he going to play? Right. Oh, how come he's not, you have to sit and watch and go through this because JT wants to play. Kirby smart wants to protect his player. 
Yeah. It's it's the give and take. The player wants on the field. The coach wants to make sure he's 100. percent The fans are all over the map. It, you know, <laughs> how did you go through and support JT and help him through what had to be a very difficult time in his life? And we're going to find out what Eric did to keep Richard going because Richard had to sit through the second. I don't know how they kept him off the field to the last play. I thought he would have run out there for a 12th man penalty at some point. But how did you keep <laughs> JT poised for the moment? And when, so that when he did and when he did play, boy, was he ready to go. Um, I would say he was he he was very early on. It got harder as the weeks went by, definitely got harder right off the bat. He knew he wasn't ready to go back in for the first game. And then, you know, within a couple of weeks, he felt like he just really wanted to help his team. He felt he wanted to be out there. He's never sat on the sidelines in 15 years. So he didn't know, he didn't really know what to do. <laughs> you know, um, Steve told me that this is exactly why you guys were at Georgia. Because you knew this yeah. wasn't a program that was going to throw him to the wolves. Even, right. even if, of course, he wants to play. Yeah. But where's the mom at in that equation? Well, I did not want him to go out too early. I totally was on board with Kirby. It was his choice, his decision. And I appreciated it, even though I wanted to see him out on the field. But if he wasn't ready to go out on the field, I did not want to see what that was going to look like either. So um, it was difficult because Steve and I flew across the country every weekend from California to Georgia or wherever they were playing. And no JT, we watched a great game. But, you know, we got to see our son on Sunday morning and just try and, you know, feel where he was at and, and you know, figure out where his mental, you know, perspective is. Um, he also, freshman year, we lived half an hour away from him from USC. We would see him every Sunday and have a meal with him. And, and that was a difficult year, too. That was a very difficult year because he was put in situations that, you know, an 18 year old would not really, you know, be able to be successful in. So that, that, that we really needed to um, be around for that year as well. I mean, that, that I would say was a difficult time, even though he was outwardly looking okay. I just feel like that was a tough situation. This wasn't as tough. Because, you know, he just, he, he wasn't ready until he was, and then he was out there and, yeah. and that was it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. JT goes from winning a national championship at modern day an undefeated season in perfection to, like you said, you know, having to deal with the realities of all those great players around you in a brand new offense and maybe not all the pieces around you are working perfect. And he's new at it too. Conversely, Erica and Richard's situation. And I think you said it and I agree with it. We have something called the game ball feature at dog nation. And boy, Richard was just all over those Kentucky wildcats. I think he had 13 tackles and three pass. He was, it was one of the most remarkable performances in, in a, in a real slobber knocker of a game, 14 to three. And it was a defensive battle and Richard was absolutely on point. He was at his pinnacle. And suddenly Richard is in a, a comeback mode and the guy who's the team leader, uh, the mayoral figure on the team, by the way, uh, Allie, he introduced himself to JT by intercepting a ball that JT thought he was throwing out of bounds. I heard the story from Steve. <laughs> He's saying, dad, I thought I was just throwing it out of bounds. There was nobody there. And oh here comes Richard. And I love it. It's, and that's Richard, of course. That's but, awesome. So, so Richard has to go from being all over the field to, to not on the field, Erica. And, and how, how did you coax help Richard through those times when he can't be on the field for his team that second half of the season? First of all, it was really tough. 
it was tough. And for all of the parents who've been through this and they can identify what I went through, they know how tough it was um, mentally, emotionally, physically, it was tough. Um, I knew um, after the doctor said um, he was fine, he didn't have any internal damages other than, than the, the damages that the whole world knew about. Um, the, the, the fracture and the, the concussion, of course. I knew it was it was time for nurturing and it was gonna take a not, lot of nurturing and a lot of positivity and a lot of building up. Um, I needed every ounce of strength I had and I reached back for a lot of the fans a lot of the fans. I know many of the parents have horror stories. I don't have them stories because I show myself friendly. And when you learn, you learn to teach, just show yourself friendly and you pour into other people and be kind. Most of the time you will get that back. A lot, granted, it may be a few that was out there saying whatever they want to say and doing what they want to do. That's life. I reach back for the fan my family, my faith in God, and we did it. We built up Richard, whether it was the parents um, driving from miles and miles, hours and hours. Um, one of the quarterback moms driven up to Athens just to come and third, help us with dinner. And they did a meal train, cash apps, flowers, whatever support that he needed to see. He's real sensitive at this time. Anybody who's been wounded or hurt on their flesh, aching body, out of your mind, wondering where your career is going, you need nurturing. And that's what we reach back for at the University of Georgia. And we got it from, whether it was from the coaching staff, their wives, <laughs> the, 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 the team did a video and personally sent it to him. I mean, it was it, it's all those things, all those components played a, a, a huge factor in getting Richard back mentally back where he needed to be. And Coach Kirby Smart is one of the smartest men I know because he knew that although Richard was hurt and injured and wasn't able to be with the team training and practicing, he was with the team. He didn't let him sit there in that bed and mope. I think by the third or the fourth day, the fourth day, he was back at at the, the facility limping on crutches on a brace <laughs> and encouraging the team. And let and that was so good for the morale of the team to let them see, listen, I'm here. I didn't die. <laughs> I'm good. I'm gonna heal and get through this. And I feel like that alone have it would make an impact on some of the younger the younger players I know they won't forget when they go through their time of adversity and have to suffer praying to God that they never do have to suffer an injury but if they do they know how and they see example I remember Richard being on the phone doing the the Florida Gators in um game and encouraging the team and wanting to go down there because we just one hour away from the Florida line. He wanted to go to that game. And I said, no, you're going to stay home and watch it on television. And you're going to take this time to heal and rest your body. <laughs> wow. he, he didn't want to do that. But yeah, it was it was the support of the whole University of Georgia and the, the support staff and their wives and and, and the messages that poured in and it was show they showed so much love. I was in Athens, I took off work. I took a leave of absence and, and I came and stayed up there. Whether it was the people at the hotel or the, the therapy or Mr. Carson, whoever, they all, everybody It's like that place at the University of Georgia. I know everybody got their own story about their, their schools, but everybody knew their place and they were marching and they, they didn't stop. It was an army of love and support and overwhelming. Everybody knows what they need to be doing. Whether it was the car picking him up because 
I was exhausted and couldn't get him the the therapy on time. (laughs) We're human. Things happen. (laughs) Someone was there to pick him up. And I, I, I just, I attribute all those things to a great environment and a, and a great loving staff of people that want to see our children thrive. That's, you, no, you're right, Erica. And, and it, this is a good time for us to take our halftime break. I'll tell you what. Yeah. Um, I don't want to say heavy lifting, but a lot of drama. We've talked about a lot of drama it in is. the first half of the Mother's Day special here that, that Richard and JT <laughs> has gone through and everyone's going, this is, this is heavy. He's like, yeah, these guys have been through a lot. I mean, they're superstars and, you know, they're on the magazine cover and all that, but you're hearing about it. There was a, there has been a lot of drama and a lot of difficulty and perseverance that JT Daniels has had to go through on the road from Southern California and the catastrophic ACL injury to Richard LeCount with the middle of the senior season that you just knew he was going to lead the dogs to a championship. A lot of heartache and pain, and you're seeing it, and you're hearing it in Allie's voice and Erica's voice because they absorbed it because they were there. They heard they heard these phone calls. I promise you, there's a lot of light being shed in these interviews, but there's a lot of conversations that stay, will stay between mom and son for the rest of their lives, you know, and, and I like what Erica said about being there in the clutch and, being there when it counted or when it was Allie and Steve flying to Athens, even though JT wasn't playing, you're talking about being there and support. And, you know, that's what Ingalls did for us throughout this entire pandemic. Such a difficult time in our society where we needed those frontline workers. We needed those people to continue to supply us and bring us the goods that we needed to support and help our families. Let's take a moment now to recognize Ingalls. It's in our hearts to feel for real. There's been ups and downs, turnarounds, there's good days and some bad. But we stand together for worse and for better. We'll always have your back. Well, welcome back. Um, again, appreciate our sponsor, Ingles. Appreciate Erica LeCount and uh, Allie Daniels joining us. This is, a, this is kind of a unique thing, right? I, you know, the, the whole Zoom concept. Don't know that there's been a Mother's Day Zoom before. <laughs> I hope there's another one, right? I hope we're, I hope we're not messing this up. I think, I think with the testimony and the character of the players that we're dealing with here, I think these are stories, though, uh, that certainly warrant attention. And, you know, Erica was talking a moment ago about Coach Smart. And, you know, we deal with Coach Smart in the media, and and, and Coach can be somewhat terse at his press conference. He's a very direct man. He's very no-nonsense. It's point A to point B without much wiggle room. You see him on the sidelines. He's incredibly intense. The smile is when the winds come. I mean, he is a very motivated and direct coach. And yet, these players are able to connect with him and they get a little bit of Kirby that I, obviously we don't see. Kirby's a former player himself. And, and Allie, I guess I would just ask you, I, I remember hearing that when JT went in the portal, that Kirby was one of the first that he heard from the, the championship um, image, if championship vision that Kirby Smart had at Georgia. I guess I would ask you about where you think JT has grown through the relationship with Kirby because it's clearly the head coach and the quarterback have to be on the same page. And I'm starting to hear Kirby say things like, you know, hey, JT raises the bar in the room. JT is, you know, doing a great job. And it, it didn't, it, but it, did, it just doesn't happen that we have to earn that. So I guess I would just ask you, how have you seen Kirby Smart affect JT as, as a person is, and as a player? Um, yeah, what you just said, I think is um... – you hit the nail on the head there. You have to earn it with him. I know um, when JT went into the portal that day, the first person who called was Kirby. And they had just a fantastic phone conversation. I'll never forget him walking down the stairs, huge smile on his face. And he goes, we're going to Georgia. (laughs) And I was like, wait a minute. Meanwhile, you know, he talked to another 15 people that day for 12 more hours. But he was sold. 
he he was sold. We said, you do your due diligence. You talk to as many people. You do what you got to do. But he knew the whole time it was Georgia. And it was weeks and weeks and hours and hours of on the phone. But Georgia was here and then everybody else was around here. So right off the bat, he had a good rapport with um, Coach Kirby and um, Coach Munkin and him, like, I mean, two peas in the pod. It was, it was crazy. Um, so then fast forward to him being here, not being ready. He didn't have much of a relationship. He was doing what he could to get on the field, but there really wasn't much of a relationship. And it has built and built. And I think after the season was over, over the last couple months, it has really grown. I know he went, they went out to lunch one-on-one, -on -one, maybe not out to lunch. I think he went to coach's office and they just talked about stuff for half an hour last week and like buds, like total buds. So it's come a long, long way since season was over. Um, and he loves Kirby. He, he just, he, you know, he really likes him and thinks he's a great coach. And that's why, why he came here. I mean, really, he just, you know, besides the, um, SEC just being the place to be, um, mm -hmm. he really fell in love with the coaches. You're right. You talk about earning respect. And even though when we think about Richard LeCount, who was Kirby's first ever public commit, and everybody knew that Richard was the cat's meow in the state of Georgia, and Kirby played safety and Richard played safety, you'd listen to some of those press conferences with Kirby Smart. You weren't sure if Richard LeCount, how much he was going to be on the field. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Rat trap Richie one. Richie was telling us that. Calls me Rat Trap Richie. I said, what does that mean? You know, Richie. Is that Richie, a compliment? <laughs> I, I think it's sort of. It was Kirby's way, I think, of, of letting Richard, you know. It, but Richard liked, just like I saw JT, I feel like I saw JT respond. Because when you play for a coach who's done it himself like Kirby. Kirby was an all-SEC guy who's won, you know, who's been a championship coordinator Obviously, you know, he's 45 years old. He's the hottest young coach in America. He's got a $180 million football pro. I mean, Kirby Smart is, is who you want to be if you're a football coach. You got to earn that. It means more when you earn it. Totally. And, right, Erica? Because you, oh, you saw and heard it with, with Richard. Because oh, yeah. Richard, you know, a lot of these coaches were probably telling Richard everything he wanted to hear to go to their place. And yet... Kirby was able to somehow get that respect from Richard and vice versa. I'll let you explain how that relationship went. Well, at one point um, early on, I remember hearing all of the, the talk from my, my coworkers, my family, my friends, the media, people is out there saying, hey, why is he so hard on LeCount? He's always rah, 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 rah. If someone don't, don't love or care about someone, they won't, they won't put that much energy or time in them. They'll just let them stand over there and do whatever. But when somebody care about somebody, or they're real passionate about a sport, or if you're real passionate about a person and love them, you're going to try to do everything you can to convince them that they need to be going on the straight path if they're going the wrong direction you you it once you're really passionate about something or got a hobby you are focused on that or are you watching someone training them even even when it's tough and even when you know you might need to slack off or brace yourself and pull back sometimes you still want the best for that person you're going to keep guiding them you're going to keep pointing to them you're going to keep encouraging them you're going to keep saying, go, Richard, go, uh, go, JT, go, uh, go, you know, who, whomever. You, you're going to keep pouring into that person when you care about it. He played that position. He got a lot more passion about that position. Not that he don't care about the other positions, but he, 
he coached that one with a lot more enthusiasm. <laughs> well, there's no question because we saw it every week and, and the expectations. But it was players. no no ill feel is no ill feeling here no more because it, at one point we were we were wondering my husband and I. But then when we got to looking at this thing, we want someone who's going to chastise our son in words in a way that he they build him up to the place he, he needs to be. And he saw that potential in him. And that makes me so happy that we we chose Georgia. Or he chose Georgia. And then we chose it with him. We, we gathered in with him as a family and supported him there. But I got to say, Hebrews 12 and 6. That is the that's the reference scripture about how God chasing whom He loves. He loves us, and He yeah. and sometimes it looks tough, but when we're not going in the right path and we're doing the right thing, He get, He got to get our attention, and that's what Kirby had to do for Richard. No one else in this country, I believe, could have coached our Richard the way Kirby did. He went to the University mm -hmm. of, of Georgia a little boy and he's a man now yeah there's no doubt ali when when is when does the mom accept that football takes the tough coaching we're in an era now i know where a lot of coaching methods and you know is a coach too hard on somebody does he yell too much is he is too tough on him is there too many wind sprints or down and ups as, as a mom, how do you get through that? Because that's your little boy for a while. How do you accept that, boy, this, this, this sport of football is very, very demanding, as Erica was talking about? Um, well, it started for JT in ninth grade, for sure. Those coaches are old school coaches. It's old school football. And, and he was, he was, you know, got used to it pretty early. And um I don't know if I'll ever get used to it. <laughs> I mean, I don't necessarily like it. I feel like, you know, I, if I was to lead, I would want to lead by inspiration, not by, you know, getting mad. So I, I don't really know. I don't know how to answer that. He's, I mean, it's just part of football, I think. So, you know, you're in a gladiator sport and it's, uh, it's tough guy. So that kind of stuff, I think, maybe goes with it. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah. And you know, Can and, and, I say this? Can I say this? Mm -hmm. I remember briefly when he was a little boy and the first time I coached him in the little league direct department. And, and I know everybody heard the story that I was his first football coach until his dad, he, he got in pads and his dad had to coach him then. But I don't think I was that charge <laughs> you're inspirational I'm i sure. was get it richard oh, go oh, go oh, I, love it. <laughs> I can so remember good. telling him if you're not afraid of them run up to him and get the ball out of his hand i told him that in basketball and in football i said just run up there and take it out of his hand and see what he do I and he love did it. It. oh my god i love it that's beautiful. Well, you're, Al, you're, you're, you're learning the, the, the magic that I learned because covering Richard, you know, Richard is such a gregarious, warm guy. You cannot help but be engaged in his presence. Certainly, <laughs> Erica is, is much the same way. Conversely, with JT, every answer is just so specific and thought out. It's just you, you wonder how he's able to compartmentalize all these things and listen into your answers tonight, Allie, you're so precise and, and direct in your answers. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of flat or not a lot of gray area here. Very direct <laughs> like your son. And I'm just trying to answer the question. <laughs> you, you feel like JT say, I, don't, I, I only know what I know. That's what JT says. I only know oh what I know. Um, be, before I let you guys go, I want to ask you about, um, you know, just, I guess a favorite, story or an anecdote and uh eric I, I guess we'll start with you i mean obviously you you know richard played so many sports and and he's been such a large part of georgia for so long he'll, he'll always be a part of georgia certainly um do you have a, a favorite mom son football memory or... i have a lot but i'm gonna okay. tell you this one let's see one that i probably didn't share with a lot of other people yet so 
Um, I got off work. My husband and I, we, we, Richard playing high school football. He's excited. Um, everybody in the town was hearing about him being recruited. Um, and he's in the ninth grade. And we show, show up to the Friday night football. The stadium is jam-packed. And, and we are so excited, you know, because Richard's going to get out there. He's pumped, you know, and play tonight. And I remember being in the stands and thinking, I wonder if they're going to say it's his birthday. You know, it's his birthday. <laughs> and I, I want them to say happy birthday to him. And, and I don't know how, but he kind of knew that I was going to probably pump that up. He'll say hype that up. So I text, um, I got the phone number. Um, no, I went on my Facebook Messenger and I, I messaged the announcer's wife. <laughs> <laughs> his name is, his name is Derek. And um <laughs> in Riceboro, you know every you got everybody on your Facebook in Riceboro. Yeah, he's from Hinesville. He's studio. from he's from Hinesville. So oh, okay. I I message his wife and I say to her, listen, we at the game. Um, can you ask your husband to announce it's my son's birthday? It's Richard's <laughs> birthday. Love and, it. and, and the whole night, Richard, I don't care. I don't know. I don't know if other parents have this weird thing happen. But all the years Richard been playing basketball, football, whatever sport, he knows directly where we are. We, we can travel for five, six hours and drive to the next state to go over to watch him play. He'll look around on that field when they're working out, and I'll watch him. He's looking around, but he knew, even in high school, he knew exactly where his father and I were sitting. Where his dad wasn't there yet, he was down on the field helping out. And so he was watching me to see if I was on my phone. So I was, I outsmarted him. I messaged the announcer's wife and I asked him, I mean, husband, <laughs> I, 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 I sent the message to the announcer's wife to ask him, will he announce Rich, happy birthday to Richard? Long story short, he in the middle, right before halftime, Richard's having a great game. Everybody knows that he doesn't celebrate his birthday on September the 11th out of the mm -hmm. honor and the respect for the, the country and the mourning of the loss of so many people. And at, at that time, he didn't celebrate on that day. And so he always celebrate on that Saturday. Well, it was that Friday night and his birthday was going to be the next day. And he, the announcer yelled out, um, happy 15th birthday, Sir Richard LeCount. And he just looked like in horror. He was so <laughs> upset because he didn't want the world to know how he was. Oh, my God. He was all excited about being on the varsity football team and being macho and all, but it, I was still trying to hold on to my little boy. <laughs> but I realized in that moment when I saw the look he gave me, that wasn't good. <laughs> so you're not going to be calling the Cleveland Browns telling them to do any announcement on Richard's birthday this fall? <laughs> no, no, no. No, they should know that already. <laughs> That's right. I'm sure no. it'll be in his biographical information. I'm sure they're going to love him, <laughs> Cleveland Brown. And the dog And the dog pound up there, it's a perfect fit with with Nick Chubb and Richards told us Nick played such a big role when yes. he came to Georgia, taking him under his wing. And I love and, the Chubb. And I wrote, a, wrote a story earlier today, Erica, about how even though Richard didn't go, maybe where everybody thought he should have gone in your mind, he went exactly where he was supposed to. It was the will of God. Right. As long as it's his, he's in his will. He's on it. He got a job. That's Richard right. got a job. <laughs> Richard got a job. Everybody else in the family had one. Richard finally got a job. He got a job. Well, well, Allie, I know that uh, I know that your husband Steve coached uh, uh, JT. Has spent a lot of time with him. Certainly, there's a lot of planning between father and son. But you've had your moments with JT as well. Uh, what's uh, one of your favorite memories of JT Daniels with his mom? JT Daniels with his mom. Um, I would say he played for. Um, it's an unlimited weight league. I'm trying to think of what the league is called, but he was an IE duck. Um, and to get there, we had to drive around a mountain. So 
<laughs> it was about a two hour drive each way wow. for practice. And we did that three days a week. So we had a lot of downtime together and we really bonded. It was my best year with him because my husband and I would, I, my daughter played volleyball. Steve was the coach for JT. So we really kind of had our roles already set. But when eighth grade came around and Steve wasn't a coach, I was able to spend a lot of time with JT and we really, really got close. I mean, that was, that was for me, the most special thing about holding him back was how close I was able to get to him that eighth grade year. And, and we still are very close and, um, and I love him. But what I, what another story that I wanted to say about him, and this goes back to what we were talking about him in the beginning of this Zoom class, um, he was in, I think it was seventh grade and it was a seven on seven tournament. And I think it was the finals. It was, they were playing their rival. It was modern day versus their rival. And JT threw the ball to this guy and he didn't catch it. He dropped it. Well, the opposing coach, one of the coaches on that team started making fun of this kid and kind of berating him. And the kid, you know, felt bad and looked down. And JT saw what happened and JT walked up to that coach and said, sir, you're a grown man talking to a child like that. Please stop. <laughs> and I didn't hear him no. do it. I didn't see him do it. I heard about it a week <laughs> later and I said, mm, <laughs> that is one of my most proud moments. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that poor kid didn't feel that bad anymore when he had someone have his back. Yeah. So yeah, that, that um, is just kind of a testament to who he is. He's a sensitive kid, but he won't show it. He's got a, he's got an exterior and he doesn't let a lot of people in, but um, the football players will see who he really is that, you know, Georgia, he will, he will show himself on um, in the locker room. And that was the other thing I was going to say about um I see some similarities between his last year in high school and this year coming up in that there's just this bond, this brotherly love that the boys feel. And it's, it's really special. And, and I feel like I, we saw that happen at modern day and the coaching staff players all over the place, just, exceptional and it just seemed like an unstoppable year and it was he won the national championship he won the theater aid yada, yada, yada. but this year feels like that same thing we when my husband and I were talking about it and we just we feel that same vibe of just the brotherly love everything being laid out and you know that championship thing coming around, you know, I don't want to, you know, say it, but I do. So, yeah. Yeah. We'll see. And time will tell, but um, it just, it feels really good. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I've seen, the, I've seen the team under Richard's leadership the same way. And now you're right. JT is coming in and I see Erica smile and she, she knows exactly how you're feeling. She felt the same way with Richard and the way the players rally around him and the camaraderie we've seen from Georgia during Richard LeCount's career. And now JT is coming into fruition. Obviously, uh, wasn't the smoothest start, but as Eric has said uh, frequently, you know, there's going to be adversity. And it's all about how you handle it That's and right. how you choose to deal with the adversity. And certainly the mothers of JT Daniels and Richard LeCount have a lot to do, if not everything, with how their sons have dealt with adversity, the type of leaders that they've become, and the compassion that they've shown their teammates. I can't thank both of you enough for this opportunity. I hope that I hope you've enjoyed it. I appreciate you trusting me. This is a, like I said, it's a it's a little different to open your heart and open your living rooms or your backyard uh, to talk to the Georgia fan base, but you know. Uh, how much they love your sons and what they mean to the University of Georgia. Uh, again, uh, Erica, thank you so much 
for your time. I was so pleased to write about Eric being, or being, or excuse me, Richard being recognized by the uh, Riceboro mayor Yay. and getting that plaque and the commemorative um, appreciation that they have for what he means for Riceboro uh, and for that region, the country, and certainly Allie. Uh, it, it's been great as Georgia has gotten to know JT. A year ago at this time, we didn't even know where JT was. We didn't know that he would one day be leading the program. And, and right now, to your point, there's a lot of people that are talking about championships. And, and now JT carries that on his shoulder. They're capable shoulders. That's why he's here. He came for those expectations and he came for that spotlight. But JT certainly carries the hopes of many people. And, uh, and I know that you and Steve have a lot to do with his capabilities and confidence doing that. So uh, again, uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for, for Ms. LeCal, uh, for Ms. Daniels. This is Mike Griffith. Thanks for joining me tonight on this Ingles on the Beat Mother's Day weekend special. Go dogs! Go dogs! Thank you! <laughs> Happy Mother's Day! Happy Mother's Day! <laughs> thank you!